رب رحيم مشفق Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So welcome all our international guests from all over the world who decided to join us today. And uh, we are talking about Dawa ilallah, how to call people to submit to Allah. And we are going through the comparative sciences. And in our study of the comparative sciences, we are now looking at one of those sciences that deals with our character, who we are, what our culture is, what we are made up of. Because our Character, our, our culture, has a very, very big influence on what we do and how successful we are in Dawah. So it's important that we analyze this. Sometimes we just throw it apart and say, don't let your culture influence your Islam. And that is very, very difficult to do. So how do you do that? How do we manage to guard ourselves? This is what we are doing in this series, inshallah. Now we said that in some cultures, and we'll find that in many Eastern cultures, for example, they will say, well, they've got to suffer in this life. You know, they're paying off karma in a way. The reason I'm here is to pay off karma for what I did in my previous life. That's the mentality. Where in the Western culture, they believe that they must suffer, 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 and maybe I must suffer even more so that I can inherit or get heaven. This is the differences between the room. One is, oh, I don't mind, I'm paying off, you know, karma, I'm gonna die anyway. And the Western culture, I must suffer, suffer, suffer so I can get through to heaven. So these are the two ways that culture has influenced people's thinking. Now, when we look at culture, there is a lot of things that culture influences our medicine. It influences our biology. It influences our spirituality. It influences the way we worship. It influences the way we live. Everything is influenced by our culture. We don't think it does, but it influences almost every avenue of our lives. So we are made up of a soul, we're made up of a body, and yes, we are made up of a cultural aspect as well. We'll see that many different countries, when they're dealing with issues, medical issues, or even psychological issues, have different reasons for why they happened. If you had to ask a policeman in most countries in the world, do you like your job that you're doing? You'll say, yeah, it's okay, what can I do? Yeah have to take it or leave it, this is how it is, you know. He'll tell you he likes the job and he'll suppress his real emotions about the work that he's doing. In our country, we have uh, like a police psychologist who, who works with policemen after they've gone through these problems. Maybe they saw a killing or something terrible happened, traumatic happens. Most of them won't go to the psychologist. I'm a chaplain with the police and the police are supposed to contact me when they're having hypertension or when they're having post-traumatic distress order. I have not ever received a phone call from a policeman admitting he suffers from post-traumatic distress disorder. If you speak to a policeman, he goes, can I do, it's a job, it's gotta keep doing it. Now if you had to ask somebody who works as a mortician, you know if he works and where they deal with the dead bodies, maybe an assistant, not the mortician himself, but the assistant, the person who wheels and cleans the body, Maybe he gets the little machine that cuts open the cranium. You say to him, do you like your job? What will you say? He'll say, I hate it. Who do you think is happier between the two? The person who works as a lab technician tells you he hates his job, but makes money. He's not suppressing his emotion. The policeman is the one that has the bigger problem because he suppresses his emotion. Many cultures suppress emotions. It's almost part of their culture. Don't let it out. Keep it all in. So we'll find a person who's got nothing to lose by saying, I hate my job, like the lab technician or the person who works with you know, dead bodies. He's got less problems than the policeman who's been taught to hide his emotions and not to because tough guys don't cry. No, cowboys don't cry, tough of thing. And he's the one who, when he does explode and he does let his emotions out, there's no controlling them. And so there's this imbalance. So when we are talking from a Dawah perspective, calling people to Islam, remember that you're going to be dealing with these types of people that are going to suppress emotions. 
I have made fatal errors over the years with people where I look at them and I see and I go, well, that's not, you know, they're never going to become a Muslim. And they're the very ones that become Muslim. And the ones that I think, oh, this is going to be an easy one, they're the one that don't. Obviously, it's Allah who chooses who becomes a Muslim or not, gives them the guidance. But we have to understand that sometimes when we are talking to people, we need to look through their culture, past their bottling up process that they might have. So you have to understand when you're looking at people from their cultural perspective, how do they deal with issues of hypertension, anxiety, problems? Do they suppress or speak? Some cultures, they wear their emotions on their sleeve, they say, you can see it. And other countries, not at all. You will never know. They're like what they call a poker face. You can't see, like, you know when they play poker and cards? They were like, you can never t read the person, see if he's actually got a good hand or not. I know it's a bad analogy to use as Muslim, but it's an expression saying you can't really read anything on his face. So there are many people who will have oppressed emotions, they will have expression. They express the oppressed emotions. So they'll project one thing and they're actually the total opposite. So or many of the people that you'll meet, or perhaps yourself, you have oppressed beliefs. Just like someone will have oppressed emotions, you'll find that people will have oppression of a belief in their religion. They've oppressed their beliefs in the religion. If you ask the policeman, do you love your job? He goes, what can I do? You know, I don't really like it, but what can I say? It's good. The lab technician, I hate this job. Tells you straight, he laughs and he carries on. Some people are like that when you speak about religion. They oppress their religious beliefs. Yes, there's something wrong with Christianity, but what can you do? You just got to keep plodding along. You know, it's Christianity. I grew up with it. It's my family's thing. I mean, if I had to change now, people will think I'm crazy. You ask another person, so are you a Christian? Oh, I hate this religion. It's stupid. Can't wait to get out of it. See, two different reactions. So understanding a culture can even help you with something as simple as asking them a question, why you're a Christian, why you're Hindu, why you're a Buddhist. So many people do not even care or want proof for why they believe what they do. So you can go to them and you can give them a, did you know that this is wrong in the Bible? And did you please watch this DVD by Bilal Phillips and this one by Dr. Lawrence Brown and this one by whoever. And they'll watch and think, I don't care. I know I'm wrong. I suppress my religious, my spiritual life. Want to know, what are you going to do when you come across somebody? Just like you gave the cards out in the police stations in my country, said if you have any post-traumatic distress disorder, contact me. No one has done it. So sometimes you will find people like that that are suppressing their spiritual lives. And they'll say, yeah, what can we do? You know, just have to accept it. Oppression of belief leads to rebellion. We found this that many, many youth that you deal with will oppress their spirituality. When they get to 20 to 30s, for the 20 year olds to the 30 year old group, they suppress their spirituality. The toughest group to work with is the 18, 19, 20, up to 30, 30, 35. That's the hardest group to deal with because they know what they should be doing they know what they're doing is wrong or right, but they suppress their spirituality. They will say to you, I agree with what you're saying, but they suppress it anyway. Let's take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're talking about suppressed spiritual emotion from a cultural perspective. Our culture can tell us to suppress our spirituality. We find this especially when kids leave high school and they go to university. It's all new for them. Many have been living in Muslim societies, many have been gone to Muslim schools, lived in a protected Muslim community, and now they go to university and they just go crazy. And their parents go, what is happening to my daughter or my son? And their son and their daughter have good gardens, but they choose to suppress their spirituality. And don't worry, it doesn't only happen with Muslims, it happens with Christians, and it happens with Buddhists, and it happens with every group. This is why we need to learn how to unsuppress those spiritual emotions that they have. Help them to break free from them. So what are we in our lives even repressing? 
in ourselves. Repression will kill you. Friends who are listening that are repressing their spirituality, those of you at university or college or school and you've decided to repress your spirituality, if you are in a secular world and you choose to suppress your emotions, eventually it will break through and you will have emotional scarring and you will have to go to a psychiatrist and get medication for it or a psychologist and maybe they'll even institutionalize yourself. Perhaps you'll even try to commit suicide as so many people do when they repress their emotional problems in their life. They refuse to deal with them and then it bursts out all in one day and they try to commit suicide. Maybe they try to take an overdose, maybe they try to slit their veins, whatever it is that they try to do, kill themselves. The same danger exists when you have spiritual suppression. When you suppress yourself spiritually, the same thing can happen. And so you have this repression that will actually kill you physically, not just talking in a spiritual sense. So we have to be very careful. Think about how you are dealing with spiritual suppression and physical spiritual suppression. Let me give you an example of spiritual physical suppression and how it can actually cause physical damage to your body. I'm not trying to scare you back into Islam. I'm trying to show you that spiritual physical repression can actually have physical consequences. Let's look at the Catholics in the world. Catholic Church, the priest, has to live his whole life celibate, never ever having any sexual relations. Same with the nuns, same with certain monks in certain orders and different religions. The highest cases of testicular cancer are found in these groups higher than any other group in the world because they have got physical spiritual repression and it has to get out and so what does it do it poisons the body it causes cancers that kill if we look the highest number in the world who have testicular or prostrate cancer come from those who are either monks nuns or priests so if you think that suppression of spiritual or physical Suppression is not going to have an outcome. We just have to look at medicine and see the numbers that we see. And they have needed medical attention because of this. It's not a natural way to be. This is why in Islam there's no such thing. Think about this. You hurt yourself and you're busy hammering. You're making this beautiful set that you see here. And you're busy hammering and you hit your finger. What comes out? You see, when we are repressing something, and we become fake with that suppression, what will come out is truth at that moment. What your heart is full of, your mouth will speak. If you are a fake Muslim, or you're a fake Christian, or you're a fake whatever it is, and you hit yourself with a hammer, you will soon see what is really full in your heart. I've told this story before, but it's worth saying again. When I was a very young man, about 13 years old, I was involved in a car accident. 13, 16, I can't remember when it was, but I was young, still schooling. And I had a car accident, and I was lying on the side of the road, unconscious, not conscious of anything that I was saying. I do not remember the event. I remember nothing that happened for the next three weeks. It's totally gone out of my brain, still to this day. I remember nothing. But there were witnesses that came to that scene where I was lying on the side of the street. And they came, and this one woman came, and she put a blanket over me. And I was swearing at her, and I was telling her all the terrible things you can possibly say to a person, to another human being. And they were shocked at this young little boy lying there saying these terrible things. But I was totally unconscious. It was my body, if you want to say, talking. My culture was speaking from my body without me even thinking. Let's fast forward it to last year. Last year, I was unable to come to the peace conference in Mumbai because I was again in a car accident. And this time, it was a very different scene. I was broke a couple of ribs and a, my pelvic bone and my collarbone, very serious state. So much so that I had to cancel traveling for almost six months. So I couldn't walk even for six months, couldn't move around, couldn't do anything. But that again, I was unconscious. And again, I have to listen to what people said I did. And the people, came to me afterwards and they said, you can't believe how nice you were and how sweet you were and the nice things you were saying to us. And I said, well, I was unconscious. I can't remember anything. They said, no, you were being sweet. You were reciting stuff. 
you were speaking in a language we had never heard. Obviously, it was reciting Quran. See the difference between the two people before Islam, after Islam. There's a calmness. Even the ambulance driver is saying, you know, normally people in your condition would be screaming and moaning and you're trying to help. You're trying to help us in doing our job. Not that I'm trying to say how great I am. I'm just trying to use it as an example how the change can take place in a person. Your body will talk. What will happen if we see you in a situation like that? If you hurt yourself or you fall down off the floor, off the step here? What will come out of your mouth? What will your actions be? So this is an example of how our culture can change depending on how we allot to change our lives or how committed we are. And by the way, in every language in the world that I have discovered so far, a profanity is a harsh word. Something when you say a cuss word or a swear word. The sound is never soft. It is always hard. Because you can't use a profanity in a soft way. Did you know that? Every culture in the world, the words for, you can think for yourself. Every profanity is harsh. But everything that is love, kindness, compassion is soft. So that is something interesting as well to have a look at. Even in cultures, it's part of your culture to say something aggressive in a hard way. It has a hard word for it. That's just by the way. So what are we talking about in this series? What is our main aim? The main aim is to understand when we're talking to people of different cultures, all these things must be in our mind. We spoke about that I said in the series we need to understand body language. But we are more interested right now looking at cultural language. Cultural language, that our body, that our cultural self, and that our soul are all working together and then they should challenge us to become better people, not repress us. We say to people, when you become a Muslim, do not lose your cultural self. Just change those things about your culture that are against Islam. When you become a Muslim and you're from Africa, you don't suddenly become an Arab. You still remain an African. If you come from Germany and you become a Muslim and the people in the community that held you become a Muslim are from India, you don't become an Indian. You still remain a German. If you're in India and the person who helped you become a Muslim is from Syria, you don't become a Syrian. You stay your culture that you're from. Why is this so important? Because how are you going to reach the people in your community from your culture if they look at you and they go, what have you become? Who are you? You keep your culture, except for those parts of your culture that are against Islam. So in the German context, no more pork, no more beer. Everything else is fine, as long as it doesn't oppose Islam. So we can see that even the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, as found in the pages of the Bible, he looked from a cultural perspective when he was speaking to people. There's a story of how Jesus peace be upon him, met a woman at the well. She was drawing water. And he said, my culture prevents me from asking you to draw water. However, I'm going to understand from your perspective. And he asked her for water. And he took it. A Jew and Samaritan hated each other, Samarian. They hated each other. So he was showing, I have to look at your cultural perspective and understand this woman from her cultural perspective. And he said to the woman, I am going to teach you how to have life. He taught her. He spoke to her how to have hope for the future instead of being culturally distant from her. There's a story in the Bible of the Good Samaritan, how this man saw all these religious people of the day walk past someone who was lying and had been beaten up. And here was a Jew that went to this man, just like Jesus went to this woman, that he was supposed to hate. And he took him fed him, put him in a hotel, put him in a five-star hotel. Literally in the day, it was like a five-star hotel. Gave all the money he could to pay for medical bills for this person. Gave him new clothes and said anything else that the expenses had come to this man, send me the bill and I'll pay for it. You see this as just a story that's found in the Bible, but it proves to us something about cultural understanding. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu understood culture. When somebody did something that was against the culture, he said he knows no better. And he told them, leave him alone. We know the story of the Bedouin. These things were not acceptable, but he had to say to them, listen, we have to understand their culture. So understanding culture is very, very, very important. Please 
Get to know the culture of the community you're going to be working with. Even if they are from your own country, there are many different cultures within your country that are different from you. If you're looking at it in the American perspective and you're Caucasian and you want to work with other Americans there, you have to understand that the African Americans look at things very different to the First Nations, look at it very different to those even from your same race group as yourself. So have to understand culture. So this is what we have been speaking about in the last three episodes. We encourage you to continue studying. Don't just accept this as the beginning and end all of the topic. Research more. Go online, find out as much as you can and get as many books about understanding culture as possible. That's all the time we have for today, so make sure you join us again, same place. So for me, I read Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق>